Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the first 100 days of the Biden administration, Insights from History. Today's show is brought to you by the College of Arts and Sciences and the History Department at The Ohio State University and by the magazine Origins, Current Events in Historical Perspective. My name is Margaret Newell, and I'm a professor of early American history here at Ohio State. I specialize in colonial and revolutionary America, and I've written about the economic causes of the American Revolution and about slavery in America. I'll be your host and moderator today. Since the administration of Franklin Roosevelt, the first 100 days of a new administration are taken as a moment to reflect on the successes and failures of the president and his agenda, or her agenda. What are the most important achievements of the Biden administration at the 100-day mark? What things still need to be done? What can we learn from history to help us make sense of the Biden administration's policies and practices? To help us answer these questions, we are joined today by four historians. Let me introduce them. Mason Hadar is a recent PhD from the Department of History at The Ohio State University. She researches westward migration and acculturation patterns in the 20th and 21st centuries. Her work has been published by, among others, HarperCollins, Seal Press, Roman and Littlefield, and St. Martin's Press. Treva B. Lindsay is an associate professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at OSU. She is a 2020-21 ACLS Mellon Scholars and Society Fellow. She is the author of Colored No More, Reinventing Black Womanhood in Washington, D.C., and the forthcoming America Goddamn, Violence, Black Women, and the Struggle for Justice. Dr. Peter Mansour is the General Raymond E. Mason Chair of Military History at Ohio State and a 26-year veteran of the U.S. Army. He served as Brigade Commander and as Executive Officer to, David, to General David Petraeus in the Iraq War and is a frequent commentator in the media on national security affairs. R. Joseph Parrott is assistant professor of history and is interested in the intersection of foreign policy, race, transnational activism, and domestic politics. He wants you to know, audience, as well, that one side of his family is from the great metropolis of Wilmington, Delaware, and that he has relatives who canvassed for Joe Biden back in 1972. So he has some history with our, our particular subject for today. So let me tell you our game plan for today. Um, in a moment, we'll open a discussion among the panelists and ask them to respond to your questions. Uh, many of you submitted questions when you registered and we'll try to answer a few of those and then we'll start taking questions from the Q&A. So you can put questions in the Q&A at any time and our moderators will try to, uh, to include them as best we can. Um, well, uh, We've received a lot of questions, so we may not be able to get to everyone. Um, before we open things up to your questions, though, each of the panelists is going to discuss um, something they feel that uh, the Biden administration has been successful about. You know, what, what are some of the successes of the first 100 days? And what are some of the omissions and failures? I'm going to start. Um, and let me say that um, I think the, the one of the big success of the Biden administration so far, in my view, is the uh, highlighting child poverty and developing concrete solutions. Uh, I think ever since the Great Society uh, programs of the Johnson administration, and even before that, the Roosevelt administration, the focus has been on poverty amongst the elderly in America. And I think I think now we're seeing a shift to the great human capital that is our, our children. So we're, we're, we see that in the um, in the bills passed recently, and we'll see them in the infrastructure proposals as well. I'd say an omission that concerns me is the maybe failure to address head on um, issues of election uh, claims of election fraud and the kind of undermining of Americans' faith in the American electoral pro process. I, I think maybe not addressing that head on was a strategy, but now I'm concerned that the big lie has been allowed to sit and um, bet, you know voices who are not friends to American democracy are filling the void. Um, now let's hear from panelist uh, Mason Hadar and hear what her views of success and failure are. Thanks, Margaret. Um, so 
I'm going to focus primarily on immigration. And during his campaign, Joe Biden promised to restore America's reputation as a paragon of welcome, of acculturation, and living up to being a nation of immigrants. The Biden-Harris platform had a 16-point to-do list for the first 100 days and a longer view set of goals for immigration reform and, um, and modernization that requires congressional support. All told, I would say Biden did more to advance immigration policy in the first 100 hours of his administration rather than the first 100 days collectively. Within hours of his inauguration, he signed 17 executive orders, 12 of them revoking harsh and counterproductive immigration policies of the previous administration. Um, notably, Biden ended the public charge and other financial penalties for would-be Americans. He prioritized removals to only seek out criminals or dangerous undocumented immigrants instead of just anyone lacking papers. He reallowed requests to evaluate deportation orders and he canceled the remaining budget for the infamous border wall, um, which notably also was previously funded by taking money away from the military and the treasury having never been authorized by Congress. So if we get to evaluate the first 104 days um, of his administration, he took a major step on Monday to um, correct the historically inadequate number of refugee admissions to the US. Um, even though it won't have immediate effect as of, as of this date, you know, we're halfway through the fiscal year 2020, 2021. Um, we've admitted fewer than 2000, which has never happened in the entire you know, course of history, regardless of what kind of administration we have in charge. Um, so it won't immediately be effective, but it is a demonstration of where we're going. So on day one, Biden halted construction of the border wall. He entered the thing that was prominently known as the Muslim ban, even though it um, also included countries that are not predominantly Muslim. And he strengthened support for those known as dreamers, who are children who were brought here by their undocumented parents as minors um, and that have been in the country at least 10 years. And Biden allowed a temporary ban on foreign work visas to expire in March, and he further secured the status of those who had temporary protected status. Um, it had been something that the previous administration had tried to undo, but the judicial system had thankfully um, prevented it from actually being enacted during, during the last administration. And um, on day 90, he directed Immigration and Customs Enforcement to change this language to stop using the word alien or illegal since these are all human beings we're talking about and humans in crisis at that. Um, on the downside, Biden's administration reopened at least one of the controversial detention centers on the border. And though he has committed strongly to reuniting families who were ripped apart, um, and he also committed to humanize the process of arrival and requesting asylum, that actually has not been accomplished yet. They're taking steps, but it's not actually, we're not, we haven't arrived anywhere. Most of the problems Biden faces are linguistic. Um, his administration won't label what's happening at the southern border a crisis. And I have mixed feelings about that because most immigration researchers don't label the migration itself as a crisis since the crisis is the thing that precipitates migration, is the thing that causes the migration. The migration itself is just an effect. Um, but it is true that the processing infrastructure at the southern border isn't sufficient to handle the tens of thousands of people who rush to the border believing that this is their chance to get in. Um, Biden is not responsible for the human smugglers and the uh, misinformation you know, in Central and South America that contributed to what is happening at the border. But now that they are our responsibility, it has become this problem to keep them safe and healthy while their cases are evaluated. So um, according to the recent polls, about a third of the country approves of Biden's progress in immigration, which is the lowest number across his, across his um, development so far. And it, the rest is split between wanting a more aggressive immigration reform, wanting more attention paid to it, and a very small percentage is you know, those who have the we're full philosophy. So um, overall, I'd say he's, you know, he's he's got like a B plus. Uh, we're we're optimistic. Uh, Professor Lindsay, uh, what what are your thoughts on successes and failures? 
Yes, uh, thank you for having me today. And um, I want to echo some of what Nathan just said. Um, I'm thinking some of what I would consider successes, particularly based on Biden's intentions or some of what he came into the presidency seeking. And if we look at the America Rescue Plan, which has many aspects and obviously caused a considerable amount of debate and tension and thinking around, would this be a moment for bipartisanship? No, but <laughs> would this be a moment in which we saw certain things happen? Would certain campaign promises be fulfilled? And where would we see the emphasis on rescue? Who would be rescued by the rescue plan? And so much of what we tend to hear across rhetoric, across parties is often focused exclusively on kind of like the middle class becomes this, this narrative, saving America's middle class, protecting America's middle class, uplifting the middle class. The middle class is the backbone of the United States and of our democracy, of our economy. And what I think is interesting are a few points here that do point towards an interest in addressing certain issues of poverty that particularly impact lower income folks. Um, first being increased affordable um, Care Act subsidies, um, that was part of the American Rescue Plan, um, the expansion of that, the expanding of food assistance, which obviously has a direct impact on communities, extending the federal moratorium on evictions, although today there was a federal ruling that the CDC had no right to have guidance regarding evictions, but an important kind of gesture within the plan, and extending um, loan payments and interest um, for, federal, for federal student loans are some of the important parts that I think have a direct impact on lower income as well as middle income people in the United States. Um, and I think that is an important kind of lens with which to look at this because we so often hear about the middle class. We often aren't talking about poverty. We often aren't talking about the most vulnerable populations, which you mentioned earlier, Margaret, certainly includes children and also concerns our um, elders. And with some of what's being proposed in the infrastructure plan and the $400 billion plan that specifically, part of the plan that specifically looks at elder care, home health care, um, care for folks with disabilities. These are important parts that I think I'll be looking to see how Biden and the Biden administration move towards making that a reality. And if that garners some possible part bipartisan support, if possible, because of the elderly component to addressing some of these issues. My uh, failure kind of conversation, I think also echoes what's already been said, but was addressed on Monday. So I kind of wrote some of my comments before Monday, but was thinking about specifically the refugee admission policy and how we're grappling with what is happening at the border and looking at still some very disturbing images and scenarios that are coming out of our borders with unaccompanied minors, um, with children, with people, uh, you know, having a nicer detention center isn't necessarily the goal of an aggressive immigration policy. And so I think it's important to put in context to say there's still obviously more time and more energy being put towards this. Vice President Kamala Harris will be someone who will have a very important role moving forward in looking at um, immigration, particularly from Central America, uh, but also wanting to be very clear about this being something that he's gone back and forth on in these first hundred days with regards to ad admissions, that there is some kind of yes, no, yes, no, that's happening, which obviously would give some of his supporters who are really looking for him to have a more forthright, aggressive, concise approach to this, some pause with how he's handling the immigration issue in the United States. Well, that's great. Um, now, Professor Parrott, I think you were gonna weigh in next. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna switch things to talk a little bit more about foreign policy. And Biden's been building around this idea that America is back after four years of Donald Trump's inward looking America first strategy. The idea is that the United States is reclaiming this mantle of global leadership that the country's really held since World War II. And specifically, the administration is repositioning the United States as the standard bearer of democracy against authoritarian regimes like China and Russia, which Pete's going to discuss with you a little bit more in a minute. 
And in real terms, what this has meant is this real emphasis on, on multilateralism and what the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has called a, a rules-based order rather than the narrow bilateral, often transactional approach of foreign affairs that we've seen for the last four years. And so as a result, there's been a real emphasis on reaffirming and even expanding uh, a lot of our relationships with key allies. Um, there have been repeated um, meetings and also loud proclamations about the United States working through problems, specifically through the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Um, and a lot of these key in initiatives have really been kind of couched in terms of NATO doing things together. Um, at the same time, on the other side of the world, there's been an emphasis and really a raising of the profile uh, of what's called the Quad Alliance between the US, Japan, Australia, and India that's dealing with a lot of um, regional Pacific issues, um, but which is also very worried about China and how these you know, democracies are going to respond to China. And, and so this is really the emphasis we've seen, and this has gone beyond these kind of key alliances to um, participation in larger multilateral organizations. So on the very first day of the Biden administration, he rejoined the, the World Health Organization that Trump had threatened to, to pull out of. And uh, he also ended up, or the administration ended up rejoining the Paris Climate Pact in mid-February. And this very much fits with Biden's overall goal of confronting what he calls the problems of the 21st century rather than fighting the old battles of 2001 or before. And so what we're seeing is this, you know, there's still this attention to great power politics between states, but, but the administration is really pushing this idea of confronting transnational issues that require cooperation uh, across borders. And that includes the current pandemic, but also, also things like climate change. And so the administration is very much viewing these as global security issues, especially climate change, which they think could potentially destabilize regions as countries have to compete for food or water. And so this has been leading Biden and his administration towards things like the Earth Day Summit that we saw two weeks ago, which is trying to put the United States in this leadership position on China and also coincidentally is kind of positioning it against the other great world polluter, which is of course China. Um, but this is also one of the areas where we're seeing the administration fall down just a little bit. The, the administration has said it's trying to get out in front and lead on the global pandemic, but there's been this very close um, kind of um, emphasis on you know, uh, vaccines in the United States first. And so there's been a lot of push to, to try to get the United States to think more broadly about helping countries in the developing world or even Europe, which is trailing behind um, the United States in terms of vaccine access. And we've been very slow to, to kind of pivot in that direction. And so China and Russia are moving into that kind of vacuum created by the United States, even though we've been saying really good things about that. And the last thing I kind of just want to mention um, briefly is this kind of mixed bag that we've had of Biden moving from this emphasis on kind of international terrorism while still talking about that to pay attention to domestic terrorism and domestic extremism that exists in the United States. And this has often um, you know, been a response to the Capitol riot in January, especially having to do with investigations and some arrests around that. But there is some larger attention to you know, this threat to the United States, which really hasn't been talked about since the 1990s. And while I haven't seen a, a whole ton that's you know, given me confidence that we're going to continue this throughout the administration, there are some positive signs that, that this is going to continue to be a priority for Merrick Garland. So that's something I'm keeping an eye on. Joe, do you have any um, any failures or any omissions that you'd toss in there? Or so the big one is is like I said, the the pandemic response. We've just been really slow taking a, a global leadership on this, mm -hmm. um, and and I also think there's some things that we're going to have to wait and see how these play out. And a few of the the kind of trickier spots Pete's going to touch on, and and I can happily revisit in um, question and answer. Okay, well, Professor Mansour, would you like to jump in with your uh, evaluation of successes and failures? Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Um, so Biden served as vice president under Obama, and, and he came into his presidency looking back on that time. And I think the big lesson that he learned was it's better to go big than play small ball. And this is the same thing with FDR's first 100 days. FDR was going to go big, end the, end the Great Depression, institute the New Deal. And his first 100 days didn't do that, but it was a time of great action. And I think we see the same thing here with, uh, with the Biden administration. The advantage that FDR had, of course, is he had a House and a Senate that was overwhelmingly democratic. Uh, and so they could uh, pass legislation um, really easily. In fact, uh, you know, they, they 
passed 15 major bills in the first, you know, 100 or so days. Uh, humorous Will Rogers uh, joked at the time that they're passing bills so fast that they don't even vote on them. They just wave to them as they go by. So, uh, but the Biden administration doesn't have that, that luxury. Um, and foreign policy is not something that, that can be changed in 100 days. All you can do is start the process. Foreign policy takes a, a long time to develop. But having said that, I would say that President Biden's first 100 days have been the busiest for a, a president in the foreign policy arena, um, perhaps in the 20th century. Uh, and that's saying a lot. Uh, Joe has covered sort of the big picture, America's back, we're gonna re-knit our alliances, we're gonna stand up to Russia and China. Uh, but he's done some very specific things and he's done them with a very experienced team. Uh, you look at the people that he's brought into office, uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, all of them have deep experience in government and, uh, and are very, very experienced. And you, you contrast that with, um, with sort of the out of the box sort of cabinet picks that uh, President Trump made and it really does uh, sharpen uh, into focus the difference between the two administrations, whatever you agree or disagree about what the administrations have done. Um, perhaps most famously, uh, from the American people's standpoint, President Biden has ended America's involvement in the war in Afghanistan. By September 11th, there will be no American troops and by, by you know, following that up, there will be no NATO troops uh, as well in Afghanistan. Now, this is not gonna end the war. The war is gonna go on. It, it will probably become much bloodier, uh, but there won't be Americans um, on the ground, no boots on the ground. Uh, it won't end America's involvement in Afghanistan, however, because we're still bankrolling uh, Ashraf Ghani's regime in, in Kabul. So we still have a role there uh, to play. And, and as long as the money flows, I don't think uh, Ga Ashraf Ghani's regime is gonna fall. Um, but it's going to make things very tenuous. And I would not expect uh, a peace treaty to result from America pulling out. The Taliban now think they can win, and uh, they will try to achieve on the battlefield what they don't think they can perhaps achieve at the negotiating table. Um, the Biden administration has basically put human rights back at, at center focus of foreign policy. He, um, President Biden last week declared the Armenian uh, catastrophe uh, in World War I, 1, 1.5 million Armenians killed during that conflict. He declared it a genocide. Now this is something that the Armenian expatriate community has been wanting for a long time. Uh, they're a fairly powerful force here in the United States, uh, but presidents have not uh, agreed to do that for fear of upsetting uh, a NATO ally, Turkey. Uh, which occupies a very important strategic position as a bridge between the Middle East and Europe. But uh, President Biden said, you know, we're going to let the chips fall where they may. If it means a, a relationship with Turkey that's uh, on the rocks for a while, then so be it. We're going to call a spade a spade and, and we're going to declare this a, a genocide. Um, he has extended for five years the New START Treaty, the nuclear arms control with Russia. Uh, and that was a big deal. He did it without any sort of conditions, which uh, some analysts didn't like. Uh, but the fact is, is that he's at least talking to Putin. Now, on the other side of that, he's sanctioned uh, Russian uh, leaders for their involvement in our election in 2020 and for the solar winds hack of our government systems. Um, and so there's a, a very much a, a realist relationship now between the United States and Russia. And, um, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, Biden has offered to meet uh, President Putin uh, in Europe somewhere. And it would be a very interesting summit meeting. Usually summit meetings are the culmination of a long period of diplomacy and they have deliverables. This one I think would be just the two sitting down and, and, and agreeing to disagree on certain things. And I think it would be pretty healthy. Um, and then finally, uh, I, the most important foreign policy development will be the relationship between the United States and China, but that's a do out. You, you can't just change things in 100 days. And in fact, uh, Biden has not ended the trade war with China. 
Um, he really hasn't changed uh, the Trump administration's policies at all in relationship to China, other than, as Joe pointed out, strengthening the Quad and knitting our alliances uh, more firmly in the Pacific. And along with the Quad, I would add the Philippines is now also looking at the United States as a more valuable uh, ally once again than, um, than what President Duterte was doing in the first four years of his term in terms of uh, bending a knee to Beijing. Uh, so I'll end there. Uh, there's lots more to talk about, but I'm sure we'll get it in the Q&A. Well, uh, thanks all panelists for, for giving us so much to think about and so many things to ask questions about. So um, we have a few questions coming in about foreign policy, but we pre we had some early questions during registration that focused on you know how the sausage gets made and on some of these domestic policies. So maybe let's pivot back and start there. Um, so several people really had questions about how, how is this agenda that's been outlined in the first 100 days actually going to be executed? So in other words, one question was, well, how might the courts react? Um, is, is the Supreme Court likely to uh, declare any of this legislation unconstitutional as it did with FDR? Um, and how is Biden going to you know, get, uh, get his plans through Congress? You know, Pete mentioned the the fact that FDR had a you know congressional majority, and so did so did many of the other presidents um, who had who pushed through a lot of activity in the first hundred days, including some of our, our 19th century predecessors. Um, so that is not a luxury that Biden enjoys. So, if, if what the panelists think about um, about those sorts of strategies. So thinking about politics and thinking about the the different sorts of power that the different branches of government have. Um, do any of our panelists have any thoughts on that question? Well, I'll, I'll take the one about the Supreme Court intervening. Um, FDR did a, a lot of unique legislation that was, um, for its time, very groundbreaking, which is why this, a lot of the legislation ended up in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court was overwhelmingly conservative, as it is now, and it rejected a lot of it that actually led FDR to consider packing the court and adding a number of justices so that there would be more liberal than conservative justices so he could get some of his legislation passed. He, he deci eventually decided not to do that. It really is a bad idea because every succeeding administration of a different party would then keep adding justices to the Supreme Court. So, um, but if you look at the legislation that President Biden has proposed, it's not all that groundbreaking in terms of uh, using various uh, powers of the presidency uh, or of the federal government to do things. It's, it's adding money to different programs. Um, it may be a, a, a different uh, policy path than the Trump administration, but it is a well-trodden path. And there probably won't be a lot of court cases on uh, you know, where, where we spend money and, and how the tax policy uh, gets written. Well, I'm going to weigh in really quickly. You know, I, I, I think, uh, I think that we've already seen some challenges. So the Ohio Attorney General has already signaled a challenge to uh, um, uh, most recent legislation and question whether it, whether the federal government has the right to direct to keep Ohio from passing a tax cut with some of the with some of the stimulus money from um, the America uh, the recent um, um, relief act, so uh, I actually do expect court challenges. But I, I think that courts are are unpredictable. I think you you know we saw we saw you know we think conservative justices appointed to carry out certain ends and we saw that they didn't really carry out the end that the president expected them to in um, in response to lawsuits about the election uh, we see that neil gorsuch actually uh, has issued a very interesting um, uh, brief and ruling opinion on cases involving Native American treaties from the 19th century, which he, he views uh, should be upheld um, at their at their word, which is really really creating a lot of interest in in you know how how you know in in some of these treaties um, that date back to the middle of the 19th century and um, whether whether the U.S. is now going to have to to meet the terms of those treaties. So I, I think I think the courts courts reactions can sometimes be sort of unpredictable, but I, I do expect some challenges and 
I think it could it could hamper some of Biden's uh, aims and goals. I look to see the administration try to get uh, try to fill vacant uh, court positions uh, to the extent they can, but there again, the lack of congressional majority is going to slow them down. Um, do our, any of our other panelists want to weigh in on on you know how Biden can use the powers that uh, and his administration can use the power that they do have and what do you see as some of these sort of structural impediments? I mean, I guess I'll just weigh in really quickly and, and talk briefly about Congress. I mean, I think, you know, Pete kind of pointed out that that key thing is that if you're comparing this to FDR, who I think in some ways Biden is is trying to replicate a little bit of that energy, if not necessarily the the overall ambitions. I mean, Congress, there, there are much smaller margins in Congress, but the one thing that that is going for Biden is that for better or worse, it's a very partisan Congress. So, so most Democrats, with a few exceptions like Joe Manchin, are going to probably line up behind the administration. Whereas when you were looking at FDR, there were divides within the party, right? There were Southern Democrats and Northern Democrats, and sometimes they could get on board um, with certain issues, but but you were you were trying to to kind of um, split the difference there. But the, the one advantage that Joe Biden doesn't have that, that FDR did is there were progressive Republicans that FDR could pull into the fold. And I think that's maybe one of the, the biggest issues, especially in the Senate, is, is partisanship has come to the point that even folks like Mitt Romney or Susan Collins, who in some ways might be um, amenable to, to cooperating with some of these, the, the party pressure that they're facing to, to kind of follow the party line is, is preventing any real negotiations. And so I think this is a problem both in terms of getting legislation passed and getting some of these initiatives passed, but also I think winning over the American people because Joe Biden I think is trying to be bipartisan, but it's very hard to sell that to the other side of the aisle when there's such pressure to kind of um, you know keep the ranks keep the ranks solid. So, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm also inclined to agree with that, and I think in some combination of all of these, I see there may be some challenges that go through the judiciary. I don't think they're going to be as successful <laughs> um, as that, but I think that we'll see the engagement of that at different points, I think, in trying to challenge particular things that may come out of the Biden administration. But I'm thinking of partisanship in this moment as an actual structure that um, Biden is going to be navigating, that Republicans are navigating, that Democrats are navigating, and to think about it as a structure and whether that's a structural impediment or that is some kind of structural relief valve <laughs> that is there to know that the margins are so slim, which then requires either an emphasis on these kinds of executive actions and um, things of that nature, or using um, his this platform as the president to really push through on certain things, to push certain kinds of conversations. But I think the structural impediment that's here that is largely in our legislative branch at this moment is so deeply embedded and hard to overcome to think about some of these larger um, infrastructural plan, the infrastructure plan. Again, we saw this even with the $15 minimum wage that initially was going to be a part of the America Rescue Plan that obviously did not end up part of the conversation, although he did um, put in place a place to raise it for federal contractors, I believe, for the $15 um, in that work. But being able to have that across the board, for instance, is something that he has been emphasizing is going to meet not just resistance um, from the opposing party, but also from within the Democratic Party. So although there's largely kind of the, the split, there are actually, I think in this moment, more Democrats who kind of lean in towards this idea of possible bipartisanship or uh, lean into the possibility of working across the aisle or disagree with some of the plans that Biden and his administration have. Um, and I think that that's going to be important to watch over the course of his presidency as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you, Chiva. I think, uh, and I also think that, um, you know, bipartisanship doesn't just mean working with Congress. And I think that, that the administration is very consciously works with, um, to work with mayors and governors uh, across party lines and has tried to create pressure from below on 
on congressional leadership that way. And, and you know, has, has sort of effectively sold a lot of the elements of this program to a larger audience because the, the, the American Rescue Act bill, you know, regularly polls a 60 plus percent approval rating and even, you know, even among including Republicans. So uh, the other thing I might say too, is I think a lot of these, I think there's potential. I thought there'd be more though in uh, January, February than we saw, because I saw in December after the, the um, under the, the last days of the Trump administration, when Congress pushed through that last COVID relief bill under Trump that, you know, a bunch of Republicans were on board and a lot of them were really excited about actually passing a bill. You've had, you have people who are in, you know, towards their end of their second term in the Senate, Republicans who have never been involved in legislation and you know, legislators want to legislate. <laughs> they want to do something. So I think there's a, there, there is a sort of tantalizing, you know, thing out there that they might to be actually involved in something that really excited Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, for example. Um, Pete, I can tell you turn on your mic, you want to jump in. And then, and then I want to pivot to some uh, a question right. about uh, some other questions about domestic policy they're pouring in. I was just going to point out that President Biden, I think his strategy is, is to try to sell his legislation to the American people. Um, his strategy polls much better with the Republicans uh, out in the electorate than it does with uh, the Democratic or the, uh, the Republican senators and representatives in Congress who, you know, basically are, are the party of no now because they're in the opposition. So he, he, he has a very hard time. He's going to have a very hard time getting any kind of legislation passed, which, and you can't just continue to pass things by reconciliation because you only can use that for uh, certain pieces of, uh, of financial legislation, uh, taxes and so forth. So I think he's taking his case to the American people and hoping that uh, they can either pressure their, their representatives and, and senators to uh, start compromising or you know, play for 2022. Uh, unfortunately, I think for the Democratic Party, I think 2022 is going to be a tough, you know, it's going to be a tough road for them. The, the one thing I, I might add there is that, um, Margaret, I think your point about the governors was big because I think that is also the part of the Republican Party that's a little bit more willing to work. So the Larry Hogan's in Maryland and uh, the Massachusetts governor, who I, I can't remember his name. I mean, these are the, the the kind of more centrist elements of the Republican Party that you don't see operating in the Senate because they don't tend to send Republican senators up from Maryland or Massachusetts. And that might also be the the way to to kind of change the direction of the Republican Party if a Larry Hogan or something if someone could become you know, one of those those leadership voices, which I, I don't think will happen by 2022, but but that may be the 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 group of the party that's worth working across the aisle with. Well, that's super super interesting. Um, uh, so I wanted to share that uh, Abraham Lincoln's 100 Days included um, arriving in office in March to find Fort Sumter was already under fire. Uh, his top general was urging him to surrender the city rather than plunge a nation into war. And sitting on his desk was the 13th Amendment, but it wasn't the 13th Amendment that we know that uh, abolished slavery. It was uh, an amendment that uh, was going to permit slavery to continue to exist in the South. Uh, and he sent it to the states to, for ratification. So uh, an, eventful, an eventful first month in office for Abraham Lincoln, but a kind of complicated record on, on race and equality in, that, in those first few days. Um, so a lot of the questions coming in are, are interested in um, um, what Biden is doing and is going to do to end systemic racism and police brutality. Uh, um, directly and indirectly. And I wondered if any of our panelists wanted to weigh in on that question. Um, well, there has been a, a clear kind of advocacy, again, as he uses his platform and appeals to the American people. Um, one of the bigger issues he's talking about is obviously the the George Floyd Act um, and, and thinking about policing, thinking about a systemic as a systemic issue and how we address that. Um, I think, you know, he's has a lot of pulls here uh, that are happening. You do have uh, on one hand and kind of groundswell of activism and things that happened in 2020 that have enlivened this conversation in 
such a distinct way um, and uh, even more so than we saw after Ferguson um, in terms of how we're talking about policing and a national discourse um, and really in a global way talking about policing uh, in, in various places and also grappling with this um, rise in crime um, that has happened in a number of places and so on one hand, you're hearing pushes for, and even in the act itself, um, increasing funding towards policing, more police presence, et cetera. And on one hand, you have um, you, you know, more progressive elements of the Democratic Party calling for the defunding of police. And I think Biden has never been right, a supporter of defunding the police, but has certainly been someone who is looking at reform in a substantive way. And I think criminal justice has been one of the major ways through which he's thinking about this and also his particular history with the 1994 crime bill and its specific legacies in minoritized communities in the United States. I think him even speaking about the Chauvin verdict and, and talking about that also um, was a quite important moment. I think within that there are larger systemic issues that I think he'll be having to contend with in thinking about everything from economic justice as it pertains to uh, communities of color, in the United States, health disparities, housing discrimination. We can name these different things. And from that statement of America not being a racist country, what then do we do with these systems where people of color, um, indigenous people are disproportionately impacted by systemic failures. And so COVID is bad for everybody, but has disproportionately affected particular communities, right? And the outcome of that, unemployment was high, it's definitely getting lower, um, was high, but who's disproportionately affected and already in low income jobs? Uh, who would be impacted most by the raise of the minimum wage. These kinds of questions, I think, speak to the ties between both economic and racial justice. And I think his approach is largely gonna be residing in the space of economic plans and infrastructure, et cetera, that have particular attention to racial disparities. I think that's where we're gonna see it. I think that will resonate with some within the Democratic Party. I think some will feel it's not progressive enough. I think some will think it's too radical. We're having conversations about critical race theory being taught in K through 12, right? There, there's all kinds of legislation here. So the climate, once again, is extremely polarized around the conversations we have around race. And I think he is leaning into that and trying to find a vocabulary and policies that speak to a broad public and tend to hopefully address some of these disparities in more substantive ways. I, I would agree with what Treva just said. I think we need to remember the United States doesn't have a national police force like you know, some countries in Europe, the Italian Carabinieri, for instance. Uh, we have local police and state police. And so a lot of the um, uh, revisions of police conduct are gonna have to come from the, the local and state level. And the president can use his bully pulpit to nudge things along. He can use, you know, lures of federal funding. Uh, but in the end, we have a lot of different police forces in the United States. And it, it's going to be up to the people at the local uh, level to reform them. Yeah, I agree with both of those things. Um, I think that he has signaled just by who he has chosen for his cabinet of um, that kind of, you know, alliance building, friendship building, speak, you know, straight from the hip. Like, it doesn't seem like he wants to mince words, but at the same time, he doesn't want to act rashly. Um, so I think he's relying on people like Anthony Blinken and Merrick Garland to use the station of their office to be able to set the platform in the Justice Department or in the State Department to make the kind of declarations like labeling the Armenian genocide or to issue a statement about the, the Floyd case. You know, I think that we're seeing it more in terms of, you know, what he's willing to um, indicate about his cards without showing us his whole hand. And I also don't want to get my hopes up, you know, too high in either direction because lots of times administrations surprise us. I mean, no one would have guessed that Lyndon Johnson would have been responsible for most of the most progressive 
you know, decisions of the 20th century, it's the civil rights legislation, progressive immigration policy, you know, uh, women's rights, like no one would have seen that Johnson is that guy. Um, and then similarly, like Reagan oversaw some of the most progressive immigration policies about, you know, um, make transferring the, you know, um, il the illegal status of millions of undocumented immigrants into, you know, rightful citizenship, you know, to that's a not a part of Reagan that people who are fond of Reagan will point to. Um, and, you know, there's plenty of people who were loved Obama, but really didn't think that he was progressive enough. And so how how Biden is actually going to end up doing issues that we think are natural for him is kind of it's kind of a, a crapshoot. And one Thank thing you, I, I'm, oh, sorry, the, just real quick. One thing I might add is, I mean, the last two days um, mentioned Merrick Garland. I mean, Merrick Garland is looking into investigating the, the cultural practice in Louisville and Minneapolis, right? But I think this might be one of the areas where we see those challenges in the court, because there's already been discussions about that, about what role the federal government can play in, as Pete said, these local police forces. And so I think there's going to be a little bit of the back and forth, because I, I think my son's right, we might be surprised by how much Joe Biden does try to, to take on some of these these things, but but there are limits to how much the, the federal government can do. And I think this court in particular, unlike the Johnson court, which was a little bit more friendly to, to some of these Johnson initiatives, I think this court in particular might limit how much, say, the Justice Department can do with local police matters. Thanks for all those great points, uh, Mason and Joe. So uh, we had several questions on foreign policy that I'd like to maybe bundle and talk about and then uh, try to save a little bit of time. And we only have about 10 minutes left for uh, a return to some some of these domestic uh, policy questions. So so to sort of maybe bundle a couple of these questions together, um, several people have written in about what our panelists said about um, policy in Asia and particularly asking about Taiwan. Others have really wanted to press uh, us and Biden on um, human rights and the issues of Uyghurs and um, other uh, oppressed ethnic minorities. Um, I have questions for the panel, which, which is, one is, are, do you see Biden as continuing the Obama playbook with the Trans-Pacific Partnership or doing something different uh, diplomatically in Asia. And I also have been expecting for, you know, maybe for a bit more than a decade for the American president would sort of look at the hemisphere and say, we want, we want, you know, let's put, we want, you know, more, more connections on the hemisphere along the lines of the European community um, in, in uh, the Americas. Um, you know, is there potential for vaccine, you know, vaccine diplomacy for new sorts of partnerships in, in the Americas, uh, um, you know, including South America, including the Caribbean. So, and any thoughts on these giant questions uh, from our panel would be appreciated. So I'll just go ahead and start with China and, and Pete, you can, you can jump in, but I mean, I see it as, as a Biden, the policy so far in this first 100 days, and I think Pete's absolutely right, you can only kind of get a sense of where things might go, right, because it's very hard to kind of steer the ship of state in a different direction. But it seems to be a little bit of a mixture of a little bit of Trump's aggressiveness towards China, but a lot of the, the Barack Obama multilateral playbook. And one of the things that I found interesting is, is there's this real emphasis on this rules-based system, setting up China as the antithesis or a challenger to this rules-based system. And so really doubling down on the system and these larger alliances um, who wanna participate in this um, kind of rules-based international order based off the UN and the WHO and you know, trade agreements and things like this as a way of specifically, and I saw this in one speech, containing China, actually using the phrase contain. And that's what the Trans-Pacific Partnership was about, right? Kind of surrounding China with certain kind of economic practices and compelling China to participate in that larger system. And so that's absolutely um, what I see the administration doing. And, and regarding the Uyghurs, one of the things that's really interesting is Anthony Blinken has said multiple times that he sees this as a genocide, which is very, strong term to use. And as, as Pete says, we're bringing human rights back in here. But then the next question is, what do you do about it? And that's been a, a much more kind of ambiguous answer for both Blinken and the administration overall, because there's this sense we need to contain China, we need to confront China rhetorically, 
and on economic matters because you know it's violating the rules of this this international order that we support that we help create after World War II. But at the same time, we can't you know cut ties with China. We can't you know we're not going to go to war with China. I mean I mean so it's been this very kind of weird um, mix of aggression and then opening the door and uh, reaching out a hand to to try to bring China in to this international system. So I'm, it's interesting to see where this is gonna go in, in future years. Yeah, I think, you know, we look back to 2014, the last time we accused someone of genocide was ISIS and we went to war with ISIS. So, the, you know, this throwing around the term genocide, it cannot be done lightly and this administration now has done it twice. Um, I wanna take the question on Taiwan because one of the, the viewers said, you know, what about Taiwan? The current policy uh, stems back way back to 1979, the Taiwan Relations Act. And it basically says um, that the United States uh, isn't going to commit to the defense of Taiwan, but commits to a, a peaceful resolution of the diplomatic dispute between Taiwan and the, and the Chinese ma mainland. Basically, everyone agrees that Taiwan and China, are, or most people agree that Taiwan and China are one country. There's just a disagreement over who should govern it and what form of government that should be. And that policy has, uh, has served us well for 40 years. Now you say, should it change? What are the other options? One option, which I've seen Leslie Gelb and others at the Council on Foreign Relations take is, let's actually recognize Taiwan and uh, ink a defense treaty with Taiwan that we will come to Taiwan's defense. If we were to do that, you can, you can count day one of the Cold War in the Pacific when we sign that piece of legislation. So that would put us into a Cold War with China for sure. Um, there are others who say we should write Taiwan off. Um, it's not worth it. Uh, China is probably going to take it over at some point anyway. Why go to war over Taiwan? And if we were to do that, you can, the United States would be written off as the guarantor of the world's democracies. We would suffer enormous uh, uh, political a loss in political prestige, diplomatic prestige. And, uh, and so I think this policy of strategic ambiguity of, of basically saying, we commit to a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan question, and um, and we will do what it takes to keep peace and order, peace and security in the Pacific region. I think that's just perfect. Um, it's strategically ambiguous. Uh, China will know that if it tries to take Taiwan by force, the United States could go to war and probably would go to war over the issue, um, but it couldn't be sure. And I think that's probably the best path forward as it's been for the past four decades. Well, let's, uh, let's try to squeeze in a discussion of some of the questions that a few uh, in our audience have raised about paying for these programs, the uh, domestic programs, and um, how to bring, how to sort of pull the 8 million unemployed Americans, unemployed due to the COVID epidemic back into the economy. And some people are, are framing these questions around worries about inflation or about immigrants um, taking American jobs and so on and so forth. So, you know, how would how would the panelists respond? How would Biden respond to or answer these sorts of uh, goals, but also concerns? I'd like to cover the inflation issue, and then we'll let someone else talk about immigrants. Would that be all right? Okay, yeah, keep it, get, it has to be a short one, so we, yep, we have to- It will be a short let, one. Let's let uh, me and uh, Shreva get in there too. Because we got, um, we got this question overnight, and it basically was a worry that all this uh, federal spending, uh, $6 trillion or so forth in the, all the COVID relief packages would, would reignite inflation. But if we take the historical look at inflation, and we're historians, uh, from basically the 1980s onward, it's been trending down. Uh, to the point where economists were wor more worried about deflation in the late uh, 2010s than they were about inflation, and deflation would be cat catastrophic. So the Biden administration is aware that all the spending could spark inflation, but it's it wouldn't be anywhere near the oil shock of the late 70s, early 80s, and it uh, and it could be contained in terms. Uh, by the Federal Reserve raising interest rates if necessary. Uh, but they, again, 
their idea is to go big. It's better to overcorrect than undercorrect in terms of getting people back to work and getting the economy going again. And then we can worry about inflation later. Uh, but now is not the time to be an inflation hawk. Um, well, the one of the things that is gets often overlooked is that um, we don't collect nearly as much in taxes as we used to, especially from corporations. If you're going to call like the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, like the glory days of America, you know, corporations paid about half of their income in tax to the government at that time. And that shored up many of the programs that we look to in that time as being stellar and supportive and the model that we were trying to export around the world. So if, if, the, if the corporate giants did their portion, I mean, and they made like stratospheric amounts of money during the pandemic, like they did not have a bad time in the pandemic unlike the 8 million people that lost their jobs. So even if they were asked to contribute as much as they used to, which they would still be wealthy, but that would also, you know, shore up the, the reserves that we are so worried about, you know, where is this money going to come from? Like there, there are other sources. I might also add that, you know, the, that investing in capital goods, right, investing in infrastructure and investing in the human capital of children, of working uh, parents to, to help them care for their parents, help them care for their children, enable them to enter the workforce. That these things are going to are going to pay dividends uh, and less money for prisons, you know, more more people employed, better education, et cetera, it, itself pays it will pay a huge dividend. So I think that's another way to weigh, weigh the cost versus um, application. Does anybody thought, want to have thought, a, a final word? I thought Mason was going to cover immigrants, but the, yeah. the question about the immigrants, uh, immigration is a net plus to our economy by far. Uh, they don't cost a lot of money in terms of, of services. It's a misnomer that we're you know, giving all these freebies to the immigrants. They come here and they, they get jobs, they pay taxes. They pay taxes uh, and don't get services in many cases. Yeah, so even if they come legally, they are a net plus. Uh, Google was started by an immigrant, right? Sergey Brin, these immigrants do great things for the United States. And so the idea that more immigration is gonna lead to somehow economic catastrophe, it's actually the opposite. We've had the lowest birth rate in the last year in, in 40 years. And if that doesn't change, the economy will go down in future years. So we need more people, not less. Yeah, I was gonna agree with that. I, I've written briefly because often that conversation is put in particularly against um, newly arrived immigrants and African-Americans in particular, and that these are competing for jobs. And again, no evidence. In fact, evidence says Peter mentioned that this is a net plus to our economy in terms of care, in terms of, of what happens with the boost to our economy. And I think it's important to think about the role that care will play and how we think about um, both the social kind of welfare state that everyone's concerned about being built out in these plans and the corporate welfare state that um, many would argue exist in terms of what our tax rates look like for corporations. So when we have rates, um, bringing them up to different rates now, thinking about taxing um, higher income individuals, particularly thinking about the top 1%, the percentage changes that Biden at this point is proposing are not overly significant um, and are not controversial to the tune of within our lifetime. These are tax rates that have existed within our lifetime and in our recent lifetime. Uh, many of the cuts um, in terms of rates that happened, happened in 2017 um, by Republicans. So we're not even talking about having to go back far into when we're talking about much higher tax rates for corporations and high earning individuals or high net worth individuals, but really returning back to um, a pre-2017 moment in terms of um, creating some of this and how the rallying around infrastructure creates jobs, how investing in this in a great immigration policy, investing in racial justice, um, investing in policy towards climate change and effectively addressing that also can be job creating um, policies um, by extension, especially for thinking long-term and not immediately what happens in the first 100 days. Even the premise of that can be very hard. It's very hard to do a lot in 100 days for any person, but certainly in terms of thinking about 
restructuring, reshaping, uh, and recalibrating a nation around particular policies, whether you agree with them or not. It's still a significant undertaking. Well. Well, thanks so much for that and fantastic way to end what was really a stimulating discussion. We could talk about this for another hour. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, there's a question in the queue about whether we should rebuild our infrastructure exactly as is, or should be rethinking things and thinking about the impact on the environment and on communities of color that deserves its own webinar. Um, but in the meantime, thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm grateful to um, uh, Drs. Haydar, Lindsay, Mansoor, and Parrot for sharing their expertise thoughts today. Please join me in giving them a virtual round of applause. And we would also like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences, especially Clara Davison, Maddie Kerma, and Jade Lack. And once again, thank you, audience, uh, for your excellent questions and your ongoing connections to Ohio State. Stay safe and healthy, and see you next time. Bye bye.